Um, I think I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I'm always uh, feel these conversations are so incredibly important and it's it's so inspiring to see them happening with more frequency as they seem to be these days. Um, my contribution, um, as was mentioned, is that I am a, I'm a photographer. I work for various magazines and newspapers. I was based in East and Central Africa for about 11 years um, in Uganda and South Sudan and Kenya. And from, from Nairobi, Kenya, I was covering the region quite extensively, a little bit in West Africa as well. Um, I, I'll, I'll show you, I'll begin to show you some images and, um, and talk to you a little bit about why I've pursued what I have in photography um, and how I make subject selections um, in order to engage with some of this discourse. So I'll, let me, okay, can everybody see my screen now, yeah? So I, I was based in, um, as I mentioned, in East and Central Africa. I was working extensively in, in DR Congo. This is an image from a church service in the town of Kichanga uh, in Eastern Congo, an area that's been the site of a lot of cyclical violence. I was working on issues related to conservation and wild trafficking. This is, um, this is an image that was taken in the Central African Republic in Zanga Sanga uh, National Preserve. Um, which is an area that is, is, is home to incredible biodiversity, large herds of, um, of uh, unhabituated forest elephants. And this was an area that was affected by the conflict that was going on uh, between the Seleka and government forces. This was uh, elements of militarized anti-poaching operations that pertain to wildlife trafficking issues also in the Central African Republic and Northern DRC. I've been deeply interested in these kinds of, of, of conflicts, but I'm fundamentally, I'm, I'm interested in the sort of social experience that people have. This is an image from uh, an area along the border of, of the Republic of Georgia and South Ossetia, which is a Russian occupied con contested territory uh, that was previously part of Georgia and was annexed in, in 2008. Uh, this is a, a, a man who lives right along this particular border with his wife um, and is in a tricky position of herding cattle uh, along this contested um, and controversial and sometimes hostile border. I've been interested in social upheaval um, and revolutions. This is images from the Egyptian revolution uh, in 2011. I spent time there when I was based in, in uh, Juba going up and, and covering these various waves of, of um of, of political upheaval that were happening first against the Mubarak government and then through the political process and ultimately with the overthrow of Mohammed, Mohammed Morsi. Um, I'm, I've been interested in climate change issues. Uh, this is an image that I've made on the mountains of uh, um, in Peru uh, during an annual pilgrimage that happens with members of the indigenous Quechua community that come from all of that region of Bolivia and Peru. And they make this annual pilgrimage to mark <clears throat> the Andean New Year and the emergence of these constellations that signify that it's the harvest season. Um, and this was part of a project about how communities deal uh, with aspects of, uh, of major change as they affect them at sort of an emotional level. So my curiosity um, about the world has really been driven by these issues that I find to be particularly interesting. And I, I pursued the photographic medium in large part because I sort of come from a, 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 the photographic world to an extent. This is a photograph of my mother that I took um, in the dark room where she worked as a, a newspaper photographer at the time. When of course uh, newspaper photographers and most photographers were working in film. So this was an image that I made of her in this dark room where she worked. And I used to spend a lot of time with her as a boy when she was printing <clears throat> images like this. She worked in a very, very tough city uh, with a lot of crime, a lot of intense poverty, um, a lot of connected social challenges. Um, and I would be with her a lot while she was making these kinds of photographs. This is an image of a woman whose son was shot during a gang confrontation. Um, they, had, they were having a memorial service for him. And not long after this picture was taken, members of the rival gang drove a car into this memorial service. So my mother was involved with a lot of these things. She was always trying to show me the sort of human dimensions and explain the sociological causes of some of the things that she was photographing. I also, on my father's side, came from my uh, sort of a photographic family well as well. This is my, my grandfather, Eric, who's an immigrant from Sweden. This is my father and my, and my aunt on the right side of the page. And 
my grandfather was a working photographer, a vocational commercial photographer, and he would make these kinds of Christmas cards and things. In addition to making these nice sort of artistic images that were in addition to his work as a commercial photographer. This is a picture of my grandmother and my father standing on the Atlantic Ocean uh, near the city of Boston, Massachusetts on the East Coast of the United States in 1939, which is almost hard to believe that uh, you know, that we had this quality of image, this vivid color, this is Kodachrome, a, a particular kind of slide film called Kodachrome that reels re these very beautiful images that have lasted this long. My father ultimately went into art conservation. So as I was growing up, he did the technical restoration on paintings and drawings and things. And this was work that I found to be as a kid incredibly, I couldn't imagine how somebody would want to take so much time which it was a profession that requires this incredible attention to detail. Um, and I couldn't imagine how somebody would want to do that. But what it, what it did was expose me to a lot of classical artwork. Um, and the, like images like this of uh, Michelangelo Caravaggio, uh, the calling of St. Matthew, which showed me how light was being used in certain ways. This is an American artist named Andrew Wyeth who painted these incredible desolated landscapes, famous painters like Edward Hopper. I didn't, I wasn't able to actually see these particular images, but this was the type of, uh, of work that I was being shown. A painter named Thomas Cole, who was very involved in conversations about the human relationship with the natural environment that gave me some sense of what conversations could be like related to that using visual media. So I started to make photographs that were sort of representations, even in, in between these two. This is uh, the beginning of a, of a series of paintings that Thomas Cole did about the human relationship with empire and these small figures in these larger landscapes. These were things I began to use in this image, like uh, as a sort of reference point in my photography. This is a image that was taken in the township of Epworth outside of Harare um, in a story that we were doing about uh, corruption inside the MDC opposition movement um, at that time. This is an image um, of registration for the vote in, in, um, in South Sudan, the independence referendum in South Sudan registration in 2010. You know, trying to utilize these visual principles that I'd learned from, from the world of classical artwork um, in the context of making photography that was about current issues that I thought were, were really important. And so in, in 2011, I started I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking with you because I make a lot of work about men and masculinity and violence and male culture and the kinds of things that we learn about and how those things end up interacting with other forces in the world. And I, I, I did that because I have been wondering about those questions in myself. Um, you know, I've had a very sort of conflicted relationship with my own sense of masculinity. My relationships with my father were much more complex than I initially understood them to be. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I learned that the man who wasn't was my was supposedly my biological father was not, in fact, my biological father. So for me, there are these kind of swirling issues in myself about what type of man I was and the kinds of things that I was learning and how my gender sort of ideas of myself, how I should project those and what I should re what I should reject and what I should endorse and what I should work on and all these things. So that conversation about men and masculinity was very alive in me. And it started to uh, manifest in my work and it did so most directly initially um, in 2011 in the Eastern DRC, uh, when the government of DR Congo in conjunction with the UN, the Armed Forces of Congo and the American Bar Association decided to um, begin these mobile military tribunals to begin to prosecute uh, at least elements of the uh, FARDC, the National Army, um, uh, of those uh, that were accused of mass rape and crimes against humanity in order to create more accountability, particularly in the East where there has been little. So there were these mobile military tribunals that were devised. This is a bailiff hanging up Joseph Kabila's picture and a sort of reference to trying to project the power of the state which as many of you know, of course, is based in Kinshasa, a far distance away along a very, across a very wide country, to, to begin the trials for <clears throat> this group of soldiers that were under the command of a man named Mutuare Kabibi. Uh, and uh, Colonel Kabibi was the highest ranking military officer at that point in Congolese history to be apprehended and, and, and face charges of this nature for, for actions that the men under his command had taken. 
Um, and this, this happened in, in the province of, of South Kivu uh, in a town called Baraka. And with intention, these trials were conducted in open space like this. You can see that the um, this was in a sort of makeshift uh, sort of covered venue where everybody could come and watch what was happening. You can see that the men in this image that are in uniform, um, those seated anyway, the ones that are seated are the ones who are facing the charges. The man standing is a is not in any um, type of, 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 of trouble. He's a member of the FARDC who's um, overseeing the process. The, the men sitting in uniforms are those who are over the age of 18. Those who are uh, in civilian clothes are under 18, and they were to face a separate judicial process because they were they were um, they weren't old enough to, 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 to face the trial as the others were. And this was, uh, this was in response to a really horrific event that happened um, in, a, in a very small mountaintop agricultural community called Fizi uh, outside of Baraka in South Kivu, a very remote area. The, the, the incident in question began here at this place. This is a small pub in the center of town called the Karibu Hotel. Um, and it was here that one of the soldiers from the unit that was uh, that was ultimately charged entered into this place. He was drinking. He was drinking with a number of men from from um, from Fizi. And as some of you know, uh, either those of you from Congo or that pay attention to Congo, but those of you who are familiar with DDR dynamics and things, in 2009 there was a, a peace agreement, the Amani Leo Agreement, that effectively, to some degree, ended the conflict between the previous iteration of, of violence that was happening in the East, the CNDP, and the Congolese government. That saw a lot of units integrated into the, into the national military structure and redeployed. So the guys who were in Fizi were part of that integration strategy, meaning they had come from different parts of the country and that were then redeployed within the federal structure to, to places where they don't necessarily are not connected to the population there. So uh, this particular soldier entered into this place. He's drinking with guys who are from that village. He starts to make an, a, an advance on a girl there uh, who the guys from Fizi say, she's, uh, she's engaged to be married, please leave her alone. And a fight breaks out. And uh, the two men go outside and there's some fighting and, and both of them were quite injured. Uh, but the impression was that the man from Fizi, the local guy, was perhaps dead. Uh, there was a rumor circulated that, that, he, that the soldier had killed him. And as the soldier is making his way back up towards the barracks, men from Fizi stopped him, uh, captured him and, and beat him to death. Um, which then, of course, rumor of the information of that reached the um, the top of the mountain where the rest of the unit was, um, and Mutuari Kibibi, the commander in charge, uh, then gave an order uh, to to go down and make some uh, serious revenge against the community, uh, with an estimation that he asked that seventy men be killed in response to the killing of one of his soldiers. So. Uh, as those of you who spend a lot of time in rural communities know, word can travel quickly uh, among people, especially word of something urgent like that. And um, someone got word down to the village that the soldiers were drunk and that they were coming down to avenge this killing um, and that they had orders to kill this large number of men. So the men fled into the, into the forest and the, um, and the soldiers set about, once, once they found the women and girls that were there, um, they set about raping uh, them and, and pillaging some of the shops, burning things, destroying property. Um, but they, they raped upwards of 60 women, perhaps more, on this particular day. Um, and so this was the first trial of that magnitude, um, dealing with something like that. This is the lead prosecutor on behalf of the government with all of these uh, women who are participating as survivors, um, um, giving testimony in the trial. And, and as this unfolded, you know, I, I, I began to feel this sense of incredible complexity as to what was happening because obviously this type of extraordinary violence against women that transpires um, in the context of conflict is something that needs to be, there needs to be enhanced accountability and, and, um, and judicial proceedings to ensure that this does not happen in the way that it does. I was also very interested in the experiences of some of these soldiers who appeared in some cases to be so young. You know, they were just over the age to make them admissible for the adult judicial process. Um, but, but they were so young, 18, 19, 20 years old, and I couldn't help but wonder 
what types of things had transpired to these in the lives of these boys that put them in a position where we are now seeing this type of violence transpiring with such regularity. Um, so these, these guys were convicted. Uh, they were sentenced to lengthy sentences of uh, including hard labor in Congolese prisons. But I was particularly interested to try to understand more, more significantly the context in which this violence would, would, uh, was occurring. So I was, was able to get a grant to go back um, to begin doing some serious investigations as to the experiences of, of ar various armed men. And, and I wasn't exclusively focused on armed men, although mostly. I ended up mostly focusing on uh, members of the, of the Congolese National Army, the FARDC. Uh, to some extent, I worked with other armed actors, um, but I also worked with civilian men as well. Um, really with the hope of trying to understand the relationship between sort of masculine aspiration, what is a society asking of men? Um, are the men able to fulfill those uh, societal expectations? Um, and if not, is there any relationship between that unfulfilled masculine aspiration and violence? Um, so these are the types of questions that I was asking in the context of the ongoing conflict in, in DR Congo. Uh, a lot of what I was doing was gathering oral histories, uh, doing a lot of extensive interviewing. Um, you know, out of that came large transcripts um, that were of, I thought, incredible insight and value in terms of understanding, at least to some extent, um, what the underpinnings of some of the violence that we're, we're dealing with is, because in, in my, my, my view is that this is ultimately, um, it's, it's an issue that men have to confront. Uh, and if we're not really going to significantly engage uh, the underpinnings of why we see men committing such egregious acts of violence so regularly and what the psychology is that men experience that pushes them to that, I think we're only going to be able to put band-aids on things um, because this is, this is an integrated problem. Of course, it's a problem that women experience. It tends to be a problem that men cause, um, but the fate of those elements are so intertwined. And um, I've really wanted to understand that as best I could uh, in, initially in the case of, 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 of Eastern DR Congo, but then much more widely across various parts of the world. How are we raising boys? What kinds of messages are we giving boys and reinforcing for them as a society? Are we teaching them as we are in this case in, in, in the United States, um, in the state of Mississippi, in the American South, to be these tough hunters hunting these incredible wild uh, very dangerous boars. And you can see this, this kid drew more on this young boy, uh, 11 years old, taking a knife, you know, they hunt these big wild pigs, uh, only using knives and dogs. And this is about being connected to some primordial tradition of male dominance over the, the sort of kingdom of animals. But it's also really involved in, in fathers and sons in this culture creating a very strong notion of overcoming fear, being willing to, uh, to confront things that might hurt you, uh, scare you in order to do a quote unquote service for, for the family, which is to return with, um, with meat. I, I'm very interested in, in, in what these experiences end up meaning for boys. You know, the, this is this short series of pictures here at the end uh, of this kid drew, you know, after we'd been chasing these pigs for kilometers and kilometers and running and everyone was exhausted. And there's the, you know, the final sort of scene here where his father flips the pig over and, and drew stabs it in the heart. Um, the dogs are involved. There's a lot of blood. Drew looks at his hand, uh, you know, and I was, I was sort of amazed as how he was examining his hand as though he was realizing what his hands had just enabled him to do. And just afterwards, he, he said, I'm so tired. And he laid down on the forest floor to kind of recuperate from this event. And, and I've, I've always felt a sense of conflict over, you know, as a photographer, we're always trying to choose the right images that convey something sort of complicated that we're encouraging people to think about. And it, it, part of that is making critical decisions that encourage the right or responsible way of considering something. And I've always felt this incredible conflict 
over which of these two images to use as the sort of ending piece of, of, of this boy's story. Because this to me feels like a boy who's a little bit lost in an act of violence that he's just participated in. And he's sort of trying to reconnect to things that are part of this innocent part of his young life. Whereas this image really feels like that same boy, but really um, sort of more quote unquote successfully um, embodying that sense of new manhood and masculinity. He looks like a little man in this image. And I've always felt a conflict over, over that. But I've been working in these different environments all over the world uh, to try to understand the kinds of experiences that boys are having um, and, and what that means for the way that they see themselves as, um, as sort of masculine figures. A lot of it, I think, has to do with our understanding of our own emotional literacy, our understanding of, uh, boy, of how we feel and sort of actively fighting at times against these ideas that are so common across so many parts of the world, the global south, the global north, you know, re across all, almost seemingly all religious lines that men should be tough, men should be stoic, men should be sort of somewhat disconnected with the way that they feel about things. And, and to me, it's been such uh, an interesting process to have opportunities to do this sort of cross-cultural survey of, uh, of the sort of core value systems and how men and boys and societies ultimately deal with the question of how, of how we sort of create men as, a, as, as societies. So there, there are a lot of images here. They come from all over the world, from South Africa to Ukraine, to the United States, uh, all over. Um, and and, and I, I think what I'll do is, is if, if anyone has questions, particularly related to either any of the decision-making process, <clears throat> excuse me, around how or why I've photographed what I have, um, or technical questions about photography or how photography can be, can be used to have these conversations related to gender. I mean, the thing that I find most incredible and important about photography is that really it doesn't require any sort of admission. Um, you know, you, it, people can, anybody uh, with two functioning eyes can look at a photograph and determine something about it. It doesn't require literacy. It doesn't require advanced education. It doesn't require any of that. It's, a, it's an extremely accessible medium. Um, and I, I, I really appreciate that about it. Um, so I think it's, an, it's, a, it's a wonderful tool. Of course, video is also, um, is also an incredibly powerful, arguably more so powerful tool at this stage. Um, but, I, but I found photography to be an incredible complement to discussions that I find to be interesting. And I guess just before I end and open it for questions, I'll, I'll just play. Um, I've been working on, um, I've been working on, on these, this sort of newer element of this project where I'm gathering a lot of oral testimony uh, from men, pairing it with images about sort of how they see themselves as men in 2021. And I've, I've started this work only in the United States, so um, it's limited at the moment, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you listen to this particular guy named Ryan, uh, this, this, this man. Um, and I recorded, I went on a writer's retreat with him uh, a couple of days ago and a couple of weeks ago, and, and I was quite interested in some of his interpretation of, of what it means to be a man these days. So I'll, I'll let this play. If I had a boat, go out on the ocean. If I had to be a good man, I don't feel like I'm a good man, but that's a whole other, that's a huge other conversation. There are certain elements of maleness, masculinity, whatever you want to call it, that are good when a man is operating in a healthy way and they provide a benefit to man to his family to society the problem comes in when that element gets off track and starts operating in a broken and unhealthy way doesn't mean that that aspect of a man is bad in and of itself but it does mean that men 
get into unhealthy ways of being men. So I think I'll I'll leave it there and and I welcome really any uh, questions, also comments, feedback, critical or otherwise. Um, I think that's always an, an incredibly important part of, of creating any documentation is, is feedback. So I welcome any and all uh, feedback or questions that people have.